Hello, everybody, and, and welcome. Uh, it is truly my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this afternoon's event. My name is Arthur Holland Michelle, and I am a writer and researcher. And I'm very excited for this afternoon's uh, panel, Surfacing the War on Terror Today, which is part of our series, Remote Control, Serving Drones and Culture Today. If we can say that the war on terror has been surfaced at all, and I think we can, it is in no small part thanks to the work, uh, in many cases, the heroic work of the people that we are so lucky to have joining us on today's panel. This symposium is organized by Highline Art, uh, the Virilist Center uh, for Politics at the New School and myself. It is convened in the context of artist Sam Durant's Highline Plinth Commission, Untitled Drone, and the Vera List Center's As For Protocols focus theme. Sam Durant's Untitled Drone is a large scale art commission that intends to increase visibility around intentionally obscured drone warfare and surveillance perpetuated by the United States and other countries. Currently on view on the High Line at 30th Street through August uh, of this year, uh, the work continues High Line's mission of presenting new, powerful, thought-provoking artworks that generate and amplify some of today's most important conversations. And if you are uh, in New York City, I highly do encourage you to uh, go and, and, and see the artwork in, in person. Now, in, of course, a, a single sculpture will not itself uh, create a whole national discourse. And so uh, to, to really expand upon and build upon the foundation that this, this sculpture has established, uh, this symposium brings together leading experts, artists, activists, academics and practitioners across a whole range of, of disciplines to examine contemporary intersections of drones, drone warfare, arts, and culture, and to demystify the twinned histories of surveillance and drone warfare. Now, as we begin, I just have a few uh, logistical announcements to run through. These announcements will also be included in the chat. Uh, it is so vital for us to have participation from the audience, and so we invite you to submit any thoughts and questions that you may have at any time during the event, uh, and to do so through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will then select from your questions for our moderator. If you would like to use closed captioning, please go to the button at the bottom of your screen and click the, the CC option. Here you will be able to turn on the captions. If you have any technical questions whatsoever, please also just drop them in the Q&A. Lastly, in the coming days after the series, there will be a recording of this event uh, posted on the Highlines uh, website for, for you if you'd like to watch it again or to pass it around uh, to those who weren't able to join us today. Now, now finally, and, and, and very importantly, although we are in a virtual space together, before we start, I, I would just like to acknowledge that I come to you today from Manhattan, New York, on the ancestral land of the Munsi Lenape. If you are interested in finding out the name of the indigenous people whose land you live on, please do visit the link in the chat. Now it gives me tremendous uh, pleasure to be able to introduce our event moderator, Madiha Tahir. Uh, Madiha is someone who I have uh, known, whose work I have followed, and most importantly, who I have admired for a very, very long time. Madiha is a Mellon postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands at ASU. Her current book project, Things Fall Out of the Sky, explores drones and digital warfare and transnational militarism in the Pakistan-Afghanistan borderlands. She is also pursuing a collaborative multimodal project on the afterlives of the War on Terror, funded by Columbia University's Brown Institute for Media Innovation. 
Tahir is the director of the short documentary and I should add extremely influential film, Wounds of Waziristan. The founder of the bilingual online journal Tankid with Mavish Ahmad and the co-director of Dispatches from Pakistan from University of Minnesota Press. A volume of essays on timely issues spearheaded by Vijay Rashad. A former journalist, Tahir received her PhD from Columbia University. Madia, I'm so happy that you're here. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Arthur. I'm very, very happy to be here today, and I'm very happy to speak with our panelists today. Um, so by way of an introduction, let me say that, um, you know, this morning news broke that the U.S. will steal $7 billion in frozen Afghan funds, use a portion of them to pay reparations to American families of 9-11 victims, and redistribute the rest as, quote unquote, humanitarian aid to Afghans. Now, I use the word steal because that is how I see it. Um, we all speak from our own positions, and I speak from my own position as both a New Yorker, a scholar on transnational militarism, and as somebody who is a refugee and whose family um, are refugees from the last American war in that region. Um, you know, I and 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 for me, I'm not not any longer interested in the niceties of euphemisms. Euphemisms keep the peace, but perhaps the peace should not be kept. And that is some of the discussion that I would like to have today with our panelists. In Afghanistan, Afghans are starving. Some are so desperate that they have resorted to eating grass. Yemenis have been facing similar conditions of mass starvation. And the situation today calls to mind empire's past. The British stole wealth and food from historical India. Between 1875 and 1900, India experienced some of the worst famines of its history. An estimated 19 million Indians died from the famine. At the same time, notes historian Mike Davis, India was supplying nearly a fifth of Britain's wheat consumption at the cost of its own food security. The country was also paying off debts to the colonial East India Company, paying for the costs for its bid, of liber its bid towards liberation in its revolt against the British in 1857, and financing British military supremacy in Asia. And I hope you can see the parallels with uh, what is happening today. Now the US, a country that has refused to pay reparations to the descendants of African slaves, a country that has refused to repair the harms of its theft and genocidal campaigns against indigenous populations of this land, a country that has managed to find billions for war annually, but none for reparations to the victims of this war, has organized yet another mass theft. Obviously, uh, I didn't intend for this to be my introduction for today, but the events compel me to say something. And today, the conversation I'd like to have with our excellent panelists here is, is to have, have a conversation that moves us beyond the terms and terminologies and frameworks that have been set to us by US Empire. So you can find the full bios of our panelists in the chat, but let me introduce them briefly. We have with us today Spencer Ackerman, who is a national security journalist and native Brooklynite. Ackerman has covered the war on terror since 2002 for publications like Wired, The Daily Beast, and The Guardian. He has shared in a Pulitzer Prize and won a National Magazine Award, among other awards. We also have with us Hina Shamsi. She is the director of the ACLU National Security Project, which is dedicated to ensuring that US national security policies and practices are consistent with the constitution, civil liberties and human rights. She engages in litigation, research and policy advocacy on issues including the freedoms of speech and association, privacy and surveillance, discrimination against racial and religious minorities, unlawful use of force and detention and torture. Um, our next panelist is Chantal Maloney. She is an associate professor of international criminal law and criminology at the University of Milan. And she is the senior legal advisor at the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights of Berlin, working on international crimes and accountability. Her research interests focus on issues related 
to individual responsibility for the commission of international crimes, as well as accountability mechanisms for grave human rights violations, including the protection of the right to life in the context of asymmetric armed conflicts and the legal consequences of unlawful drone strikes. And finally, joining us today is Sonia Kennebec. She is an award-winning director and producer, and she has released three critically acclaimed independent feature films, uh, National Bird, uh, Enemies of the State, and finally, most recently in 2021, The United States versus Reality Winner. Kennebec received the 2021 Adrian Shelley Excellence in Filmmaking Award, and she was on Doc NYC's 40 under 40 list. Welcome to all of you today. I'm really happy to be able to have this conversation with you. Um, so I'll just dive right in. Um, I think the first question to me today uh, is, perhaps I'll start with you, Spencer, is, is the war over? Um, last September, Biden told the UN, I stand here today for the first time in 20 years with the United States, not at war. We've turned the page, end quote. And yet we have what is happening today in Afghanistan. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering in your view, is this something similar to Bush's, um, George Bush's, you know, mission accomplished kind of moment, or is there something different happening here? Uh, thank you very much, Mideh, I'll say that uh, you expressed uh, the stifling, overwhelming influence and power of euphemism throughout these past 20 years of the war on terror extremely eloquently and in the context of nothing um, less urgent than a mass starvation engineered by the United States of America, it is ludicrous to speak of a war being over when deliberate acts of policy from, as you mentioned, the theft of Afghanistan's resources, the deliberate collapse of its economy and the destruction, almost sledgehammer-like um, in its unsubtlety of the Afghan banking sector is endangering the lives of tens of millions of people. That is not a condition that I think anyone can recognize as peace unless you are so accustomed within the national security decision-making apparatus of the United States as to view people with such an extraordinary degree of abstraction that even when you have stopped killing them with lethal means, with occupations, with airstrikes, that their lives mean so little, especially in conditions where the limits of American empire, as in Iraq, as in Afghanistan, are so exposed as to initiate a policy that if it were uh, accomplished with lethal means because of how indiscriminate it is, we would unequivocally and without hesitation describe it as a war crime. That's what the United States is doing in Afghanistan at this minute. It's what it's been doing in Afghanistan since the withdrawal of US troops in August. And furthermore, it is in microcosm a demonstration of how the war on terror perpetuates itself by categorizing as discontinuities it, um, events that indicate retrenchment and redirection, but ultimately remain as committed to the same ends as any uh, explicitly violent action uh, the United States undertakes. And before I, I, I hear um, what my extremely distinguished co-panelists have to say, I just want to say that you can, you can see this um, in a line um, stretching back multiple administrations, not just from uh, the Bush administration's mission accomplished moment, but in Iraq, it's declarations that as the Iraqis stand up, we stand down, Barack Obama's insistence after escalating the war in Afghanistan, that ultimately it was over in 2014. Similarly, his withdrawal from Iraq in 2011, combined with his reinvasion in 2014, the Trump administration on multiple occasions actively declared 
that the war in Syria was over and the United States had left, only to reorient it on a more explicitly extractive purpose. This is the war on terror across both parties for 20 years, and we should not fool ourselves into thinking that we see right now its final form. Thank you so much, Spencer. I want to pull in um, Hina into this conversation. Hina, um, you've been involved in legal work for, well, I think almost as long as the war is, this war has been going on. So I'm wondering, um, can you give us your reflections on the legal landscape and how it's changed and evolved? And specifically to this question of whether the war is over or not, does this have a bearing or affect, affect legal cases going forward and how so? Um, I'm thinking here specifically of Abu Zubaydah's case, which I'm sure you know better than me, is in front of the Supreme Court. And on October 6th, the acting solicitor general told the court I'm quoting here that the, that is the government's position that notwithstanding withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, we, as in the US, continue to be engaged in hostilities with Al-Qaeda, end quote. So that's on October 6th, well after the August 30th withdrawal and well after Biden's speech in September. Um, so I'm wondering kind of how this affects uh, the legal landscape and would what's happening in Afghanistan today be considered a war crime as uh, Spencer has uh, noted. Uh, sorry, so that's uh, multiple questions to you, but um, I invite you to answer whichever ones you see fit. Yeah. Um, I uh, thank you, Medea, very much, and thank you uh, to my co-panelists and the organizers for for this event. You know, I I was before you got to your few questions, I was actually just compiling in my head and thinking, where can I find who has put together the list of euphemisms for the kinds of things that we're talking about, you know, starting with enhanced interrogation to even the term targeted killing, which, um, you know, it, it stopped being accurate just within a couple of years after that term started being used to, for example, the latest term of over the horizon strikes, um, which is another term for extrajudicial killing. Um, and, you know, I'm someone who, yes, exactly as you said, works to uphold and seek to enforce law, even as I recognize that law is a very limited tool um, and has proven to be a limited tool in that way because structures such as judicial opinions have interpreted away too often the kinds of protections that you think law ought to be able to provide when there are such terrible systemic violations as torture for which we still have no meaningful real accountability or unlawful killing, which we're still struggling to have recognized. That said, you know, the kinds of question you're asking are very, very profound because if we set aside law entirely, we set aside one of the most important tools we have, not the only one, um, sometimes not the most, let me tell you, definitely not the most perfect one, but still a tool for enforcement, for organizing. And from my perspective as a lawyer for clients, for storytelling, you know, um, and so it becomes really, really important that with the U.S. withdrawal, that there be a recognition that the war in a legal sense is in fact over, because without that, you will have continu continuity of arguments such as the one that you quoted, Medea, that um, there's war-based authority to detain or war-based authority to kill. And I say this both as a lawyer, but also as an occasional teacher, that you know, when you're talking about the laws of war, putting euphemism aside, 
the conundrum at the heart of the laws of war is that they regulate brutality. But so long as war exists, there have to be rules to regulate brutality. And right. one concern I have is that despite the withdrawal, there will still continue to be claims of war-based authority connected to Afghanistan that will continue the indefinite detention of men at Guantanamo because we haven't forgotten the men at Guantanamo or uh, the others who would continue to be detained or that there's war-based authority to kill right. in Afghanistan or, you know, Medea, you and I go way, way back, but it was that war-based authority that was used to justify strikes in Pakistan as well. Right. You know, the authorization for use of military force over 20 years old, intended only to apply to Afghanistan, is on latest count being invoked for 19 different countries. And as of April last year, the Bush, the Biden administration, excuse me, was following the precedent set by the Trump administration of saying that the places and groups against which war-based authority is being used must be kept secret. And so part of why I think it's so, you know, this country has the muscle memory for getting into conflict for getting into war and war-based authority. It is a complete risk of losing the muscle memory of getting out of conflict. And that becomes so important because otherwise what happens is you displace in a way that is existential, truly existential, and like some of the war-based claims that have been made, um, the means and mechanisms through which state power is constrained within our system. Um, and you displace the peacetime rules that apply to constrain state power, imperfect though they are, we're not starting from perfection by any means, but that becomes a really, really important thing. And I say that also because, you know, one of the things that becomes a euphemism here is the incredible heartbreaking violence that in, is mostly, fortunately for most people in this country, invisible to them, but is not invisible to the people upon who it is visited. You know, I'm just coming from a call and I'll stop after this, you know, just working on, um, the situation for my clients who are currently in Afghanistan in the midst of, you know, so much devastation. Um, and, and I cannot forget that these are fathers who've described having to gather up the body parts of their children as a result of a drone strike. People who are struggling with their despair at the loss of their loved ones. This is a lifelong grief. It doesn't go away. Thank you for that, Hina. I have um, several follow-up questions, but I want to pull in um, Chantal and Sonia before circling back. Um, Chantal, thank you for uh, being with us here today. Um, the question I had was, you know, we're, we're talking about euphemisms, and I think as um, Hina mentioned, I, I, I believe you've written a piece on the fact that targeted killing is a sort of, I don't know, for lack of a better term, a term of art, which is uh, something that perhaps most people don't recognize that it's not necessarily a clearly delineated uh, body of law. So I'm wondering if you can speak to that. So that's kind of one question. And then more broadly, I'm wondering about your kind of litigating you know us legitimacy from a european perspective what has that been like and what's been your experience yeah thank you so much for your question and indeed i was uh, linking my thoughts to what hina already said 
we are using a lot of euphemisms, uh, enhance interrogation techniques instead of torture, targeted killings instead of homicides or extrajudicial killing, extraordinary renditions instead of kidnappings. And these are not only, from my point of view, euphemisms, and therefore, of course, to reject, but they, they also convey a wrong message as we were dealing with sort of legal concepts. So these terms are used in a way that try to convey the message, targeted killing is something regulated by law, which is not. On the contrary, and um, even more broadly, we need to think about the use we do of the term war on terror. War on terror in itself is wrong. And it's a misleading concept because uh, as such, this that is going on since September 2001 is not a war in itself. There can be separate operations that can be defined legally speaking as wars. So it's so important what Hina was saying about uh, being able to declare uh, what is an armed conflict, uh, therefore, legally speaking, uh, it is regulated by the international humanitarian law, so falls under the concept of laws of war and what is not. And uh, here, I think this was one of the major uh, problems. It's, it's huge. It's like it destroyed our legal uh, traditions, uh, these uh, um, mix uh, and his confusion that was deliberately done between what is war and what is uh, peace and what is outside the armed conflict. And of course, the technology, the drones uh, have a lot to say, have a big role here to play because, and we can talk better about it maybe later, but drones uh, have made possible to conduct uh, these military operations in non-war uh, zones, uh, but uh, using lethal force uh, without the need, for instance, to pass through the Congress or to the parliaments uh, in Europe, uh, uh, pretending that they were not war, uh, but in the end, uh, using uh, the war terminology in order to justify these killings, uh, which are, of course, unlawful. And I think here the European perspective would have a lot to say because in Europe we have a long history and tradition of counterterrorism, internal counterterrorism that has been dealt with through the use of criminal law tools, law enforcement. Um, I just mentioned Germany and Italy, for instance, as two countries that have very strong uh, tradition in this sense. And unfortunately, what we have seen in the past 20 years, on the contrary, is that we, as European countries, the governments have followed uh, uh, this uh, misconception, these twisted uh, uh, legal frameworks that put all of us in a gray zone, supposedly, that is not regulated by law, with the idea that we had to respond to an exceptional threat with exceptional tools that would not fit into any legal framework. And this, I think, is the most dangerous thing that happened and that we need to counter. And of course, Europe here has a huge role to play. I will tell you better maybe later about uh, our perspective, uh, because we try to tackle the issue from the European complicity uh, yeah. side. Okay, thank you so much, Chantal. Uh, Sonia, uh, I wanted to bring you into this conversation. You've done a number of remarkable documentaries um, and you've filmed with uh, Daniel Hale and with Reality Winner um, and, you know, the war we've been talking about international spaces that in some ways there are aspects of this war that are at home within the United States, particularly on attacks on whistleblowers in your in this case. So I wondering if you could talk to us about who Daniel Hale and Reality Winner are and sort of what has been your experience in following um, what has happened with them and to them and your experience in filming these documentaries. Yeah, we have the euphemisms and then we have the secrecy. And I think, you know, these two things are really, um, you know, so problematic for, you know, what should be a functioning democracy because the public is deprived of 
crucial information about things like um, drone warfare. And so Daniel Hale, um, he was one of my lead characters, a whistleblower in, in, in my film National Bird about the US drone war. And during the production of the film, he was raided by the FBI for espionage. And then much, much later, um, did it become you know, public uh, that he had not only discussed, um, you know, in, in my film, his work as a signals intelligence analyst in the, in the US drone program, but he has also provided uh, classified information about drone strikes and civilian casualties. And uh, at some point, he was facing 50 years in prison under the Espionage Act. And um, he has now um, pled guilty to, to one charge under the Espionage Act, and he's actually in, in prison right now. The information that he has provided to the public, I think, is crucial in, in understanding how, you know, the drone program works and um, and you know and how you know c civilians are um, you know impacted and affected and and so his information was you know my opinion very very clearly in the public interest but you know what does that mean for other people who see and witness government misconduct and want to speak out when the stakes are so high and you can face so much prison time. I think what, what I've been seeing in, in, in my work is that there's you know, tremendous fear and you know, within you know, the, the military and veterans and people who could provide crucial information to the public, but also amongst journalists and filmmakers. You know, and, and just the general public, it just creates this atmosphere um, of, of fear and self-censorship that I think, you know, goes far beyond, you know, whistleblower prosecution. And then Reality Winner, um, it's my most recent film, United States versus Reality Winner. Um, Reality Winners is, is um, um, the first, uh, you know, was the first NSA whistleblower um, after Edward Snowden. And, uh, and she disclosed information about Russian election interference. And she was arrested and, and also charged under the Espionage Act. And she received the longest sentence a whistleblower ever received in a federal court, um, 63 months in prison. And she was just you know, very recently uh, released and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, the, the same, you know, issue as with Daniel Hale. I think the consequences of whistleblower prosecutions are, you know, it, it's so tremendously um, destructive for a democracy and, and journalism and, and filmmaking because this is information the public should, should need to know. Thank you. I, I want to uh, stick on the uh, stick with this question of drones specifically, Spencer. I'm wondering whether the specificity of drones is the technology um, has shaped reporting on the war on terror, and in what ways has it shaped reporting on the war on terror? Has it kind of constrained storytelling? Has it how? Just wondering how has it shaped uh, storytelling around the war on terror? So in uh, two ways. Um, first, uh, there is a distorting effect that happens in journalism when a new or novel technology is introduced, uh, where the story is not what the technology does when it works as intended, but about the you know, differences in platform and so forth uh, that um, deliver um, death. Um, secondly, it has the distorting effect um, of uh, reducing the entirety of the war um, to a kind of binary choice by which uh, the war uh, unfolds on the ground, or it could be uh, transposed 
Um, and I'm sorry, it could be, um, it could be replaced uh, with a drone strike, as if these things are in opposition to each other. You hear this constantly, you hear this a lot during the Obama administration, uh, but you hear it constantly in national security discussions, as if the drone is, is somehow um, outside a continuum of violence. Um, and then it also has, um, for I think more fundamental reasons, but um, lesser remarked upon, uh, the distorting effect of uh, obscuring the ways in which that private companies like General Atomics, which makes the Predator and the Reaper, um, and now uh, a kind of ominously named platform uh, in the third generation called the Avenger, um, have been the winners of the admittedly euphemistically named War on Terror. That uh, I think a lot of times uh, we don't do a sufficient job uh, conveying to our readers that this is big business, uh, that in fact, th that in fact, war is and an, an, um, what uh, a lot of times you'll hear euphemistically referred to as the defense industrial base is the only sort of state capitalism that the United States has, that this is public money that uh, finances and provides windfalls to an immensely profitable, globally influential, globally destructive, globally extractive private enterprise. That's a really fascinating point about the, uh, it being a form of state capitalism. Um, I want to sort of, we tend to think about drones as kind of these minimalist weapons, but um, Chantal, we know that they rely on all kinds of infrastructures, um, including infrastructures in Europe. And so I was wondering if you could just give us a sense of what are these infrastructures that they rely on, that the US relies on more generally for the war on terror, and kind of what, what are the cases that you've been engaging in around these questions? Yeah, indeed. Uh, the drone, of course, is not uh, just a vehicle that is uh, flying uh, alone uh, in the sky and targeting someone. There is a huge infrastructure that includes uh, uh, huge infrastructures in Europe. Uh, and in particular, I can mention two kinds of infrastructures. Uh, um, the first one uh, um, on the model of what we see in uh, the military airbase uh, of Sigonella in Italy, where there is a huge uh, presence of uh, military uh, vehicles, including drones, armed uh, and not, uh, but many armed, that of course take off from there to conduct their operations in Northern Africa. And then there are other kind of infrastructures that maybe are not uh, um, like, and they are not uh, including uh, the presence uh, of vehicles like in Rammstein in the south of Germany, which is also this air um, base uh, where uh, there is uh, the most important relay station, um, basically the radio communications that enable uh, the US drones to, to, to fly, for instance, to Afghanistan or to Yemen. This would not be possible without the relay station uh, that is on German soil. And on the basis of these, um, we, and when I say we, I now uh, speak on behalf of the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights in Berlin. We filed already together with Reprieve in 2014, a first uh, case uh, against the German government because exactly this is the point that without data, the, in this case, the German complicity, uh, these uh, strikes uh, conducted by the US uh, would not be possible. And the idea behind the case is that uh, uh, Germany is uh, responsible for violations of fundamental rights. And in the first place, of course, the right to life uh, of people affected by these strikes uh, that are made possible uh, because of Rammstein. Right. And specifically, the case was about uh, the killing of uh, two members of the Ali Jaber family in uh, Yemen in 2012. Uh, and the case was then brought in 2014, as I said, by some of the relatives uh, of the persons killed. 
And uh, it is an administrative law case, which means that uh, it is based on the article that is in the German constitution that protects the right to, ri the right to life. And there was a first big success at the first stage in front of the higher administrative court in Münster, uh, which uh, found that Germany was responsible indeed uh, to protect uh, the right to life uh, for future strikes uh, of those uh, potentially affected by these strikes and that the German government had to take uh, action to make sure that uh, these operations conducted materially by the US, but thanks to the German technology, I mean, to the technology on the German soil, uh, were in compliance with international law and human rights law, and uh, of course, uh, German law. And so this was a huge success also because the um, tribunal um, accepted that the plaintiffs, uh, Yemeni citizens, uh, had uh, stand in front of a German tribunal. Of course, the German government uh, appealed this and uh, they got a reversal in uh, 2019 um, by the Federal Administrative Court. And this was then uh, again appealed uh, by CCHR and Reprieve uh, in front of the Constitutional Court. So there is a Constitutional Court uh, case pending uh, um, since 2021 and we are waiting uh, to to see the new developments so this was the first uh, uh, case i maybe can tell you later about another one that has to do with italy so these this this raise this distributed architecture really raises the question of how we adjudicate questions of responsibility um, beyond, you know, the question of states. Um, I'm thinking, you know, for the Kabul drone strike, for instance, um, as I understand it, you know, no one really has been charged for it or found guilty of any sort of crime for it, for, for, for that particular case. So I'm wondering kind of how, you know, if, to the extent that you're able to talk about the case, and you may not be, but broadly speaking, Hina, if you could tell us what happened in the Kabul drone strike and kind of how are adjudications made, um, you know, about who is to blame? Is it the person, human, pushing the button? Is it the broader processes of the engineers that are involved? Is it the surveillance algorithms? How do we make these adjudications? Um. I think adjudications would be another euphemism in this <laughs> on our side, maybe. Um, but let me come back to that. If I could just um, add a couple of things when I'm, I'm talking about drones in particular. Yeah. Um, you know, they've so important, grabbed the public imagination. But I always want to start out by saying, let's not forget how devastating weapons of war that have long existed can already be. Um, in Afghanistan, for example, the massive number of civilian deaths and injuries, more of them were caused by regular airstrikes than by drones, right? So it just feels really important to acknowledge that even as we then reflect on what drones have done, which is, yes, lower the barrier to entry into use of force um, because of the reality or perception that it is more remote, less risky, more easy to deploy. There are any number of factors that go into that. But there's also a nomenclature around drones that it in itself is misleading. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I testified before Congress earlier this week, and I throw that out as if I do that all the time. I don't. It was my first time. So, you know, kind of a intimidating big deal for me. But, um, but the witnesses that were pro the you know drone targeted killing they kept talking about precision 
And most people think that precision means accuracy, but that's not true. Spencer, do you want to jump in? Were you, were you? Well, I want to hear what you have to say before I do, but I do want to, I, yes. So, you know, the way in military parlance, precision targeting is used is it talks about a system of assets, euphemism, mm -hmm. um, that are brought to bear upon a strike. And part of what was so frustrating in terms of a conversation about precision was that it doesn't actually answer the question of whether you're doing the things to protect civilians, even assuming you're in a recognized war, right? And the precision language as used by the military doesn't really answer that question mm. um, as strikes over and over again, um, starting in Yemen, uh, then Pakistan, Somalia, and continuing into the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Syria, um, you know, now it's in Niger. In those areas, for many of those countries, when drone strikes or airstrikes started being used, it was completely unlawful. There was not a domestic law justification, nor was there an international law justification. So the US then created this edifice of secret legal interpretations for expanding justifications for where force would be used that are then applied to secret facts based on secret evidence with outcomes that for much of the last 20 years have been officially secret. Mm. You know, um, especially when we're talking about when the CIA is conducting strikes or uh, special ops are doing it and you know there's this landmark investigative series by Azmat Khan and her colleagues New York Times that really reveal what are likely possible war crimes in countries where there was actual recognized war and we're coming to find that out after five years mm. you know what more are we going to find out about and so that brings me back to the drone strike in um, Afghanistan, where my clients, loved ones, including seven children, their lives were obliterated. And, you know, I was talking about this earlier in the week, but as early as 2013, there was a Joint Chiefs of Staff study that said that the leading cause of civilian deaths and injuries in Afghanistan was misidentification of the target based on their perceived hostile intent. And then they turned out to be civilians. And years later, that is in essence what the uh, Inspector General of the Air Force found with respect to the strike that killed Zemarai Ahmadi, an aid worker for a California-based NGO and his family, which was confirmation bias, right? They followed his car for eight hours and thought he had hostile intent, didn't really question that, and then killed him and killed his family members. And then that brings me back to your adjudication question, Medea. As far as I know, the only situation in which people have been held responsible for an airstrike in which civilian harm occurred was Kunduz, the MSF Doctors Without Borders strike in, in Afghanistan. The overwhelming pattern is that the military command, put aside the CIA because there's no accountability there. So the military command that conducts 
the strike investigates itself. It usually does not do what civil society and media do, which is interview people, interview witnesses, do more sophisticated in investigations. It uses its own data and then it absolves itself for any wrongdoing using, you know, probably another defining phrase of the last 20 years, which is mistakes were made. And no one is then held responsible. And then people wonder why there is a legitimacy crisis with the United States reputation abroad or its reputation for accountability. Um, and so, you know, that's part of what I think we're all still working on and looking for. I guess I wonder what would, wait, let me just ask Spencer, did you want to jump in? If it's all right, yes. I just yes. thought um, Tina's point about what precision actually is, is so crucial and so poorly understood. And if I could just expand on it real quick, she is absolutely right to focus on precision um, as a process bureaucratically rather than either an outcome delivered or um, a condition that exists when it comes to the end point of the strike, actually taking the strike. There's another way that precision exists that is also obscured by the term, and that is the airframe. A drone is an incredibly wobbly um, and not particularly reliable airframe. It can only carry essentially an anti-tank missile used as an air-to-ground missile that's about 100 pounds. And the US military describes that as precision. When you actually look at places um, where the drones strike, um, and you know, it's, it's very easy to imagine this is like, you know, particularly after Osmond Khan's tremendous series, um, in a place as dense as Mosul, you don't even need to. When you look at um, you know, places like Dadakhel in Pakistan, um, in, in um, the tribal areas of Pakistan, what delivers quote unquote precision is a greater or lesser amount of density in which people live together, which is one of the reasons among the things you hear so often amongst sub, uh, survivors of drone strikes was that whole families are wiped out because they're taking the strike on a house, not on a person or on a car, not on a person and so forth. Sometimes at a business gathering, um, things like that. Now, thank you, I apologize for hijack. No, not at all, not at all. I, I, so I'm wondering what would, you know, I, I, I did watch the Senate Judiciary hearing and, and um, it, it was great to watch you, Hina. I also saw um, uh, Radia Al Mutawakkil, who is the director, I believe, of a human rights organization in Yemen, Watana. And one of the things that she said that struck me was she said it's hard to know what would ever be enough to convince the US military to address the civilian harm that it has caused in places like Yemen. And so I, I, I you know, and she was talking about the fact that they had done extensive investigations um, and had provided a report and evidence to um, US command and, and basically had received no response from them. And so I, I'm wondering what is the kind of what is our hope in terms of um, putting these cases out there? And what is our hope in terms of what can ever be enough? I mean, what more can we, uh, can we do in terms of producing uh, results? That's one part of it. And the other part of it is, uh, you know, recently, um, it, because it seems to me a question of will. And the reason I say that is, is in part, uh, and not evidence. And the reason I say that is in part recently, as you probably know, in, in Tempe, Arizona, there was a, a case where a remotely piloted Uber car killed a pedestrian, right? And in that case, um, the remote driver has been charged with negligent homicide. Um, so I'm, 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 it, it struck me, it's interesting that in, in a domestic case, we can very quickly figure out um, to, to you know, blame somebody and charge them, but that in an international case of remotely operated drone warfare, we're not able to find anybody um, to, you know, nobody, nobody ends up getting, getting charged. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that, Hina. Um, thanks, Nadia. And I'm so glad yeah. you brought up Radia. Uh, she's one yeah. of my heroes in, in this world. Um, does just, she and her, her 
colleagues just do such amazing, amazing, relentless, tireless work in Yemen. Um, and I struggle with, with this question a lot. I think for in perhaps like so many others who've been working in this area, I did not think when I started out that change would take so long or be so incremental. Um, and from my perspective, there's always the work that, you know, I have the privilege of getting to do that Chantal does that others do of actually representing clients and trying to make sure that through a particular case, the ability to support and elevate um, that, you know, that change comes about through that. But for me, change has got to be structural. And change also has got to be based within not just impacted communities, but broader communities. And that can feel very, very daunting, except that we are, I think, at a point where for reasons that might not be your, my reasons or your reasons or anyone else's on the screen's reason, I think in this country, people are genuinely tired of forever wars. And in some way, you know, you might argue, well, it's not so much on the front pages anymore. But then I think about the August 29th strike, which is still very much on the front pages or the New York Times investigation or the work that Sonia does or that others are continuing to do. And I think about, and, and Spencer's heard me talk about this before, but it just feels so, so important to me, which is that when the racial justice protests took place that really important summer, and it was, you know, against the killings of Black people, George Floyd, but people were drawing the connections between militarization abroad and militarization at home, and whose bodies is violence perpetrated against. And that's where I tend to find more of my hope and inspiration um, for systemic structural change that had, whatever you may think of either of them, the presidents of presidential candidates for both parties promised to end endless war, right? Like that was a generationally different thing. And for me, it's all part of how do you how do you move things forward in order for the structural overhaul and reforms to take place, which would not only include clients' cases, but also war powers, get us out of this militarized force first response to actual or perceived threats. You know, that's that's what I try and think about all the time. Like with each thing, how do we move forward towards the broader thing as well? Uh Chantal, uh, can you t tell us a little bit more about sort of the criminal law aspect uh, that you said uh, that you had met, alluded to earlier? I know that in Pakistan, where there were drone cases brought against in domestic courts, uh, cases against the CIA, that they were actually using Italian cases as a model. So I'm wondering if you could um, speak a little bit about that. Yeah, first of all, sorry, I need to set the record straight because I think before I said that it was in 2019, the Federal Administrative Court decision in the Rammstein case uh, in the Ali Jaber, and it was uh, November 2020. So just for the record. Um, yeah, regarding the use of criminal law or administrative law, of course, this is a, an aspect that we always have to carefully uh, analyze because uh, you are focusing basically on completely different uh, um, things. Uh, if you use uh, uh, the protection of the right to life for the future as a sort of the government has uh, to guarantee for the future rather than the criminal law aspect, uh, which tries to assess uh, 
individual criminal responsibilities for the past, uh, for something that had happened in the past. So they are very different models. Uh, and also in the first case, normally, when you when you use administrative law, it's a state responsibility. So it's a government that has to take actions, uh, precautions, uh, become active. And the other case is based on individual criminal responsibilities. And as usual, when you use criminal law with the regard to the commission of these kind of crimes, we are talking about yes, yeah, structural crimes, systemic crimes, state crimes in the end. It is difficult, although possible, but difficult to individualize the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And especially in front of domestic courts, if we talk about um, the same, the court of the same state, it's very difficult to find, of course, uh, a system that investigates itself. And when you go in front of foreign jurisdictions, third states courts, so there is always the issue of immunity if you are dealing with official capacities. So it's a very, very difficult uh, um, fight. And we are in the process um, in Italy to, um, to file to file a case that is based uh, on uh, individual criminal responsibilities, uh, in particular of those who are in uh, command and in charge of this military base of Sigonella. I cannot give too many details, but we are really working uh, now at the very, very final stage in a couple of weeks. I hope it will um, be public and we sort of announced uh, some pieces already it has to do with uh, uh, a strike in Libya that killed uh, um, like a, a group of civilians uh, back in 2018. We believe that in some cases uh, um, this effort because it's a huge effort uh, to individualize the responsibility can help uh, also in uh, shedding some light uh, on um, other aspects that for us as civil society organizations are often difficult to, to, to find out uh, because of course the state puts uh, the state secret uh, on uh, everything that has to do with this uh, drone program. And so through the intervention of uh, a criminal prosecutor, a state prosecutor, sometimes it's easier to get access to some information that states are really trying their best to hide uh, from us. Uh, in Italy, there was uh, maybe what you refer to is the case of Loporto. Loporto was an Italian victim of a drone strike uh, in Pakistan. He was killed uh, by a drone uh, um, by the US. Uh, um, and it is one of the only cases where at the time was Obama, the president uh, admitted uh, that it was uh, a tragic uh, mistake uh, and uh, paid ex gratia uh, a consider, uh, I mean, an amount of money which um, yeah, went to the family. Still, the family wanted to know exactly what happened, what was the reason why their son was killed, and the investigation has proven to be incredibly difficult because, of course, the US is not cooperating, but uh, the lawyer is still fighting there. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there are, there are, definitely a lot of uh, attempts uh, and uh, we are keeping the fight. Um, I, there's a question here which I um, which is about the forever wars and, and the current situation in Ukraine. Um, are we is the United States walking into a new forever war? Is this a different situation what we're seeing with Ukraine? Open it up to anybody to take a stab at it. Thoughts, <laughs> Spencer. Yeah, any thoughts? 
uh, without having, I haven't reported on Ukraine, so I don't want to just talk out okay. of, yeah. Okay. Well, let me um, shift this, 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 the conversation slightly and, and, and because we've been talking about this already, but the sort of the elephant in the room in some respects is the question of race. And Spencer, it's, um, you have put it very much in sort of at the heart of your analysis on 9-11 in your work. Uh, I think you called it an or in the, uh, this is what Trump was mining, essentially. This was the gold of the war on terror in many respects. So can you sort of talk a little bit about that? Sure, and uh, to start off talking with an example that uh, Chantal brought up, um, in early 2016, I was interviewing uh, Pammy and many survivors of drone strikes or people who were related to people who did not survive and a fixation of them in a way that simply was not discussed in the United States, but a fixation was that Obama had apologized to two white people, but would not so much as acknowledge that their suffering ever happened at all, let alone provide any recompense for it. Um, you know, Hina has heard me talk about this um, a whole lot, but there is really no way you can understand the war on terror without looking just in the face of its structural racism. Um, on a couple different axes, I'll just name a, a few. First, we see the war on terror in its fullness by looking at those to whom it doesn't apply and will never apply. You get about as um, exact a prologue to 9-11 as could be um, for this test case in Oklahoma City in 1995, when a white supremacist, uh, someone deeply steeped in the uh, political violence of white revolutionaries in the United States, um, blows up the Oklahoma City um, Murrah building um, and kills 168 people, including 19 children. And when Timothy McVeigh is brought to trial, there is no demand that he be transferred to military custody. There's no demand that he be tortured. There's no demand that um, allowing him to speak publicly at trial or appear at trial is a venue for terrorist propaganda. There is also no investigative focus on any perpetrator or material accomplice, um, let alone the non-material uh, infrastructure um, behind the plot. And the person who drove that very narrow focus is Merrick Garland, now the Attorney General of the United States. You see this as well with how um, when uh, there is a uh, law passed to respond to Oklahoma City, um, it only speaks to increased surveillance, prosecutorial penalties, uh, financial restrictions, and so forth, of people with ties to foreign terrorist organizations. It loosens uh, the requirements for any kind of criminal penalty uh, to people not just uh, who are involved in any act of violence, but are involved in any activity that a banned organization might contribute to. This is uh, a kind of 1.0 of the Patriot Act, a kind of beta test of the Patriot Act that really shows a whole lot about where the war on terror after 9-11 is going to go, which is that exactly the same sorts of behavior, political violence, will only be treated as threats to US national security when they come from people who do not draw from mainstream traditions of American history, people whose political violence doesn't color them in their eyes as patriots but something completely different. And we see that in how, when the war on terror is unleashed, it does not only happen abroad, it is very, very deep at home. It's something that manifests itself, you know, those of us who are New Yorkers um, learned after 9-11 where the NYPD becomes a secret police, taking literal CIA officials, sometimes detailing them from the CIA, to uh, the NYPD's intelligence division, which is headed by a CIA former, um, and uh, infiltrating Muslim communities 
around New York City, not for any suspicion of crime, but to understand what political speech is like. They called themselves rakers for kind of raking coals, as they would put it, uh, to try and discover some fiery ember. All that is is community suspicion. All of it is racialized. The FBI does the same thing on a national scale, putting informants like the NYPD does. Um, in people's places of worship as well as their businesses. What sort of freedom of religion exists when your co-worshippers, the people you assemble to in congregation for a spiritual communion could potentially be informants for a law enforcement agency? The Department of Homeland Security to bring it back, Mediha, to something that um, you referenced, um, becomes not just a mechanism for transforming immigration into a counterterrorism context, but for distributing money and resources to politic, I'm sorry, to police departments around the country that we will see starting in Ferguson, especially in 2014, are used against protests against capitalism and against uh, racial um, injustice and essentially um, the way capitalism manifests itself in the United States through race. All of this um, culminates in a very scary way. I shouldn't say culminates. Uh, but shows a kind of next phase of the ratchet in the summer of 2020, when the Department of Homeland Security flies drones over 15 American cities that are uh, engaged in acts of protest, um, calling for uh, Black liberation and in solidarity uh, with those calling for Black liberation, shoving people in Portland into unmarked vans, using the tools of the war on terror um, that start out abroad but also draw on traditions very, very deeply American going back 400 years. The first time America uses a stress position on someone, it's on enslaved people in the holds of ships. These are very deep currents in American history that express themselves after 9-11. All of it, I think, uh, can be understood very, very well through the prism of racism and through the ways in which US national security, I'm going to just take a line from Hina on a panel uh, that we shared a couple months ago that US national security needs to be understood for the degrees to which it represents structural racism. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Sonia, I, uh, you know, you've been also engaged in these difficult questions about questions of race um, and how to engage your you know, questions of responsibility and ethics in your documentary filmmaking. Um, you filmed people, the victims or survivors really of the Oruzgan strike in which, which also happened in Afghanistan where I, I believe 33 people were killed, right? Um, and so can you speak a little bit about how you sort of engage the question of ethics in, in, in engaging with and speaking with um, survivors of the US war? and why that's important. So I'm thinking here again, by co in contrast to your work, I'm thinking here of you know, Jihad Rehab, which is a film that just recently premiered um, at the Sundance Film Festival. And it was very controversial and um, two uh, Sundance staffers even resigned in protest over it. So I was wondering if you could speak about these issues. Yeah. Um... It, it, I'm also like, you know, while I was listening to all of you, you know, I was thinking when you said earlier, like, what could we do, right? Like, what, how can we, how can we counter, um, you know, all these like problematic narratives and also, you know, d d this like war and terror and in general. And, and one of the things that I kept getting back to because it's all connected, right? The secrecy, the euphemisms, um, the lack of reporting which you know has been still you know striking me and like you know you have reported on on drone strikes so many years ago and then last year um you know the new york times does this investigation and everyone's like oh my gosh you know this 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 happened civilians are being killed and that was the 20th year anniversary of the first reported drone strike in afghanistan and so you know the, and, and I think this reporting was crucial and so important, but it also should have been done 
many, many, many times before in the past 20 years. And, and that's where, you know, this, this, this lack of information, this lack of education, the secrecy, you know, just, you know, it becomes a cause of the perpetuation of these, you know, strikes on civilians because it's like out of sight, out of mind, you know, same as Guantanamo Bay. And, um, and I think we have to, all of us, you know, and, and, and all our connections and journalism and filmmaking, we have to keep pushing for responsible, accurate um, journalistic reporting and investigations on, on these issues. Um, and yeah, you just mentioned, you know, like a, a example of um, problematic reporting has been this film, um, Jihad Rehab, which I just recently saw at, at the Sundance Film Festival. And, um, and there are a number of problems, you know, with it, you know, starting, of course, with the title, which, um, you know, is, is problematic and offensive, um, you know, equating jihad with um, terrorism, even though it has, you know, much deeper spiritual, religious um, meaning to it. And then also, you know, just saying that it's something to, you know, be rehabbed, um, you know, like the, the title alone has, has a lot of, you know, layers that we could discuss here. But, but then what was really disturbing to me is when I watched the film, so it portrays um, four men who, you know, are, were arbitrarily, unlawfully detained in Guantanamo Bay, tortured, so they are torture survivors. They were cleared of all charges and were then transferred to a detention facility in Saudi Arabia, which um, this film, as well as the Saudi Arabian government, has been trying to, um, you know, promote or describe as a rehabilitation center. And the film introduces the men, all cleared of all charges, as terrorists. And, um, and that, you know, if anyone, you know, knows about Guantanamo Bay or even Googles Guantanamo Bay and understands that, you know, most people there and, and Hina has, you know, written, you know, extensively about it. Um, you know, very, very few people have even been, you know, charged or tried there um, to, to put that the blanket label on is very, very problematic. And then, you know, January um, of this year, you know, when the Sundance Film Festival took place, there was also the 20th year anniversary of Guantanamo Bay, which is, you know, it's, it's in, it doesn't comply with international law, US law, you know, there, there are so many problems with it. So this film comes out and then reviewers and publications would repeat the misinformation in the film. And, and that I think, you know, for, for many people, um, other, you know, filmmakers who are highly respect, um, Muslim Arab filmmakers have been, you know, speaking out because it is like this type of information, you know, to, to get such a big uh, misinformation, to get such a big audience and then be repeated, um, that is it's just, a, you know, a continuation of so much harm that has already been done. Thank you. Uh, I wanna sort of probe, you also mentioned this, this question of secrecy. And I wanna specifically ask about the role of the public um, secret here, Spencer, in reporting, um, which is, you know, there, there are things that the public doesn't actually know. And then there are things like the CIA bombing of Pakistan, which is officially was secret, but of course everybody knew that it was happening. Um, and in 2012, I'd like you to sort of comment on this quote. In 2012, the Neiman Watchdog Group at Harvard asked the New York Times reporter, Scott Shane, about uh, the fact that uh, the New York Times was sort of smearing anti-drone advocates in Pakistan with anonymous official quote quotations by US governmental officials. And Scott Shane's response to, um, 
to the Neiman Watchdog Group was the following. He said, quote, in the meantime, journalists often have a, have a choice of quoting anonymous officials or writing stories about accusations of bad strikes and innocent deaths and including no response at all. I feel it's important to include some voice from the other side and my editors have agreed. In addition, it seems to me important to citizens to know what the government says, even if some citizens find the statements un unpersuasive or worse, end quote. So I'm wondering if you can sort of comment on that, this one side, other sideism um, that has been quite prevalent in uh, American journalism and sort of, it seems to me elides the power differential between <laughs> survivors on the one side and un unnamed governmental officials um, on the other. And along with that, you know, with the New York Times, it's, Azmuth has done some absolutely stellar reporting, um, but it is interesting that the New York Times, you know, is not noting the fact that they are the ones who for 20 years were publishing anonymous officials talking about strikes being accurate. So I guess what I'm asking is, what is the kind of responsibility just, you know, of the media? Sorry, go ahead. I think the media has really shown itself to be quite an irresponsible actor in the United States. Over the last 20 years, I would hardly exclude myself from that judgment. Um, an enormous amount of structural factors, but I can just tell you from having, you know, worked on these issues in a variety of news, um, the degree to which Well, I think you're 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 cutting out almost entirely. Um, yeah, um, Spencer, I think you're cutting out. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe can I jump in with something while we're waiting for Spencer? Yes. To come yes. Back? Absolutely. But, just to talk about secrecy and how ludicrous yes. it is. And I'm going to talk yes. about a case that I lost yeah. um, because unfortunately I've had to, you know, but um, case that we lost, I think it was in 2018, 2019, was to, uh, was that the government won in its argument that it could keep secret that John Kerry had acknowledged a targeted killing program in Pakistan through the use of drones. So that continues as a matter of law mm -hmm. to be a secret. So I think a lot about just how ludicrous it is that you can have official secrecy about something that the entire world knows to be true. So when we're thinking about institutions, um, just setting aside, you know, being a lawyer and doing all of those briefs and arguing in the language of law, but institutions lose their credibility when they uphold these kinds of, of claims. Yeah. Spencer's back. I'll stop talking. Hi, sorry. I guess I would just uh, say yes, sorry about that. Uh, they're, they're tearing up my street. Um, I, I would just say real quick, um, um, in case this point didn't come through, that um, you have uh, a basic embarrassment. Uh oh, gone again. <laughs> And then jump in this time yes. to, I yes. wanted to, to say something linking to what Hina just said, because I mean, in Italy, in 2016, uh, it became public, uh, thanks to uh, an inquiry by the Wall Street Journal, uh, that uh, the US and Italy had agreed uh, on uh, the presence of armed drones on Sigonella. And this uh, was revealed uh, by the media and the Italian government, uh, was taken, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> um, had to admit uh, on the wake of this inquiry that that was the case. And they said so in press conferences, they admitted. So we filed our FOIA 
of course, not to know every detail about uh, these, uh, but to know what was the legal framework that Italy gave itself uh, uh, to agree on these. And we are litigating this now since uh, six years. In March, uh, I am uh, for the sixth time in front of the administrative tribunal, which denied us already three times uh, using state secret uh, to say that they can end international relations, of course, and uh, um, to, to, to say that it's secret something that has been revealed in 2016 and the entire world knows already about it. So just to confirm what he's, Hina was saying is just crazy what is going on there. I want to move us. We are at uh, almost at close of so audience members. If you have any questions, post them now. But um, so let, let me just move us towards kind of moving forward. Um, it, 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 it seems that, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering now with, um, we've talked about BLM and we've talked about, you know, with BLM, there's been police abolition movements. There's now, I was recently looking at an article in Just Security talking about abolition as kind of a framework. And I know in Chantal, in Europe, the, const, the you know, context is very, very different. But I'm wondering, you know, for the ACLU, for instance, or for other legal uh, rights organizations within the United States, could abolition be a horizon that is, you know, that is possible within within this kind of work? Abolition of drones, war. Uh, abolition of the uh, American military uh, industrial complex. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a very sort of radical vision, but this is part of one of these, um, you know, it is when we start talking about, uh, you know, in tandem with the prison abolition movement, right, which is calling for the abolition of prisons, there has been a conversation around the question of abolition in the international context. Um, so that's kind of what I'm wondering about. And yeah, so that, yeah, that's the kind of question. Yeah, I think, I think, well, we're, the ACLU is certainly not there. <laughs> um, I, I think I would want to probably have that sort of define more just institutionally, what does that work look like, right? And, and you know, the way, I think about it is one of our focuses for the last 20 plus years has been an end, or you might say abolition of the global war paradigm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that in itself is, is, I think, one of the core areas of priority and emphasis in order to be able to do what part of my job is, which is respond to people's immediate needs, you know, and do so in such a way that it helps advance a vision of a world in which there is equality and dignity. Let me just ask, what, is, what is the ACLU's current position on, on drone warfare? Our position is not so much on the weapons platform, yeah. but on the rules and laws that govern and limit and constrain state power. Right. You know, we'll talk about drones, and I do talk about drones in the ways of like how they look barriers for peace, but our focus is abuses of state power. And going going forward, do you do, do you sort of see Biden? You know, Biden's been talking about over the horizon warfare. Do you sort of see this continuing in other respects? That is part of what takes up my every single day, which is to prevent that from happening, and then if that happens, figuring out what we what we do next. I want to thank you all for um, joining us today. Um, it's been a great conversation. I wish we had more time to, to delve into questions, but um, we do want to move to the next uh, panel. So I want to hand it over to, um, oh, Spencer, you're back. Do you have any final thoughts?
on the question that you were. <laughs> so sorry about that. Real quick, I think um, a lot of newsrooms after uh, Ferguson in 2014 went through a kind of reconsideration of the ways in which the stories we produce were built around statements from police. That hasn't happened with the military, with the CIA, with the NSA, with the things that we call national security. But this is all one thing. There aren't two United States that does one thing overseas and something different at home. There's only continuity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for a wonderful panel and a conversation. Really, I wish I could have um, continued the conversation, but I want to hand it over to Melanie now to close us out. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Madiha, Spencer, Hina, Sonia, and Chantal, uh, for this absolutely powerful talk. Um, over the last few years around Sam's Art Commission, we've had so many conversations about the war on terror, so-called, and ongoing conflicts. It's been remarkable to hear you all unmask so many of the euphemisms and even the questions that we take for granted. Um, I'll say at Highland Art at, and at the Vera Liz Center, we're lucky to work with artists every day who open up our views into the world in creative ways. And it's really so special to share this series, both with artists and with you all and your expertise to open up and change the way that we even take for granted or see perspectives on the world. Um, so I'm really honored to have been uh, able to share this space with you all as extremely distinguished panelists. Um, and I'm excited to share the recording of this conversation online in the coming weeks. So again, Thank you all for your time and your preparation and your insights.